how, how do you how do you put that in a grid? You know, how do you judge a man? What's a practical balance, biblical way to find that out? So how much believe, time to spend, or what? Yeah, in our democratic set up church government, oh. it has to go world. How do we do we ask? Do you pray? Yeah. Okay, voting there. I mean, well, you I mean, know, I would think, and I've always wondered this, why they don't do this. Who's a great question? I, I've always wondered, why do church boards, when they're interviewing a pastor, not ask the question, tell us about your devotional life today. What did you do today? Put mm-hmm. him on the spot, basically. Well, no, it shouldn't be on the spot. You guys could answer him. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> why is it on the spot? Well, tell us who you're married to. Mary Orban Friedman. What color hair she has? Red. Tell me about your devotional life. Well, today's 28, so I did. I mean, tell them. It's not putting them on the spot. It's it's truth now. If they haven't been doing it, then they're rightfully put on the spot. By the way, I would ask some questions of the board. <laughs> I got a great, I got a great, if you email me, I'll send it to you, okay? But I won't do it unless you email me. 40 questions you need to ask the board when you're interviewed. What's your email address? We have, I have a 40 questions you ought to ask them. One of them ought to be that one. Tell me about y'all's prayer life. I want to know the board. Hey, hey, you over there. <laughs> Chairman. I might, I might find a, a better way to ask it than that, but I'd like to know about y'all's prayer life. What did you do today? By the way, a lot of other things I'd like to know about, too, you know? i like to know if every member of the board's going to be tithing when I come as a, their leader. i like to know if every member of the board's going to be at the prayer meeting when I come. i like to know if every member of the board's willing to go with me to do personal evangelism on Thursday nights. No, that's not the only thing I want to know. I want to know some things about that board, don't you? I want to know the names of the last three secretaries and the last three pastors. In other words, you want to exegete that group of people before you take them on. Now, they want to exegete you, right? They want to analyze you. They want to know about you. I'm, if I'm the pastor, I want to know about them. I'm the one that has to move my belongings to this place. I want to know about them. Uh, John West had that receptivity principle. Remember that? He says, I want to go to the place that they're most open to hearing what i got to say. Yeah, I want to go to that congregation too. Because with a congregation like that, you can do enormous things. Well, one of the things I want to know about is their prayer and devotional lives. They're bored. They don't want to know about the people. And of course, it's not probably going to be a very impressive answer. But you still have to discern, but are they open to making it an impressive answer? Stanley Jones, Methodist Missionary in India, described the devotional time of Scripture as, I love this, you all know, remember Polaroids? Yeah, yeah, you know what a Polaroid is? Everybody's got an iPhone now, so no one remembers a Polaroid. You know what I'm talking about, Polaroid? Did your mom, when we were three years old, use a Polaroid on you? Take this thing, and you know, eventually it becomes a picture, but it's not a picture where it comes out. Yeah, what do you got to do? You wave it around a little while, right? Try to expose it. Uh, to air and sun and wherever else needs to be exposed to. But this, he says, is like time exposure to God. Like a photographic plate which, when exposed to God, progressively bore the image of Christ in keeping with the length of exposure. Expose more, become more like Jesus. I like that. That's why in his Song of Ascents, he suggests that the most important thing he ever did in ministry was to establish a two-hour-a-day devotional habit. And I'll remind you, he started that back in college. At 18 years of age, he said, I've got to get serious about this stuff. And it sustained him through a lifetime adventure for God. Excerpts from Richard Foster's Celebration of Discipline. Have you appreciated uh, Richard Foster's writings? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Not by any means uh, our tradition, but uh, as a Quaker, writes some pretty profound things. Mm-hmm. Uh, Martin Luther says, I have so much business I cannot get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. God does nothing but an answer to prayer, said John Wesley, and backed up that conviction by spending a pretty substantial amount himself. The most notable feature of David Brainerd's life was praying. His journal is permeated with accounts of prayer, fasting, meditation. He says, I love to be alone in my cottage where I can spend much time in prayer. 
I set apart this day for secret fasting and prayer to God. William Penn testified of George Fox that above all, he excelled in prayer. The most awful, living, reverent frame I ever felt or beheld, I must say, was his in prayer. Adam M. Judson sought the withdrawal from business and company seven times a day in order to engage in the holy work of prayer. He began at dawn, then at 9, 12, 3, 6, 9, and midnight, time to secret prayer. By the way, uh, one of the bishops of the Nazarene Church uh, carried bags for Stanley Jones for a year. Wouldn't that be cool? Pick, pick the holiest guy you know and let me carry his bag for a year. And he went around with Stanley Jones for a year and did this. And uh, So I, you know, I love Stanley Jones. So I went up and said, well, tell me, what was it like? What's he like? Uh, he said, well, he, he, lo he loved him, great guy, profound and everything. But he says, he really could upset people. I said, well, what do you mean by that? He says, because when it was time to pray, he would, even if he had to do it rudely, dismiss himself and go to pray. <laughs> or he would dismiss himself and leave because it was time to go to bed. You know, there'd be somebody that waited their whole life to meet East Stanley Jones, and here he is finally, and gives him five minutes and then goes to bed. Why? Because he had to get up the next morning because he had a 5 a.m. appointment with Jesus. And he never misses his appointment with Jesus. Yeah, that's just the kind of life he lived. And John Wesley is much the same thing. Uh, just, you know, I've, I've got appointments. And my most important appointments are with God, not with you. <laughs> yeah, but you can look at that different ways because your appointment with God could be with that person that you're talking to at that moment, too. Maybe, but that's not how they looked at it. You can argue with Stanley Jones and uh, John Wesley on that. They just said, we're blocking off this time for the Lord. And that's, we're just going to maintain that. And, and indeed, they did. I think they should be asking the Lord at that moment if they're to be you know, with that person or to be leaving to do their thing. I think their comeback would be, yeah, we did. And we said, Lord, should we block out times for you or not? And we felt like the Lord said, block out times. You know, that may be, that may be their comeback. Sure. But the point, the point was, I, and, and, you know, we'll get the Jesus thing, because I want to bring to you something tomorrow where I'll show you exactly Jesus' prayer life and what he did, because it was actually very physical. <laughs> He did some things with a prayer shawl and, and tassels involved. It's all kind of fun, but I need to, I need to have that stuff with me. But uh, Jesus, the, the whole community stopped three times a day. Everybody stopped. You either ran to the temple, tried to get inside the temple, or when the hour of prayer started, or if you couldn't make it there, you stopped right where you were, put on your prayer shawl, lifted up this tassel, lifted up that tassel, and said, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Akkad. And went on and did the uh, Shema and the 18 Tefillah, the 18 Benedictions. You think, what are those? That's what I'm telling you. He had an order to his madness. He had a way that he did what he did, and he was very strict about it, what the whole community was. Now, nobody's strict about it. No one cares. We'll pray when we get around to it, and oh, we don't get around to it. So that's the other angle of that, that a guy like John Wesley or Stanley Jones looks so strange and rude. I said, what's ruder? Saying, I don't miss my appointment with Jesus and we have an appointment for 5 a.m. Or, I never miss my appointments with men and never had time for Jesus. And so Jesus, I believe, kind of said, uh, I'm going to have set times of prayer, I'm going to have special times of prayer, and I believe, because I think it's part of the point you're making, and, and that is, but he had time for people too. Yeah. I would, and, 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 and the wildest times for people. I mean, he didn't go to even the people you're supposed to go to. He went to tax collector's houses. You don't do that. And he was willing to take that extra measure as well to say, and I'll spend time in relationship uh, with folks that other people only want to spend time with. So it's, it's all over here. Well, I was just building off what I think she's dri driving at. It, it seems like that to say we'll keep our point with, with God and break it with men or we'll keep it with men and break it with God seems to be too concretely, you know, too bipolar opposites. And in reality, uh, we want to make our time with God the top priority, but it's not going to be necessarily to that, always to that greater uh, degree cutting us off from our time with man. 
Are you following what I'm saying? I follow exactly what you're saying. I'm just saying that's not how John Wesson lived his life, nor is that the way Stanley Jones lived his life. They just said, we're blocking it out. Yeah. It's that important to us. And I think it needs to be that important to you. Not necessarily to block out time, but to take it that seriously. However you do it. Right, because if we if we were to merely mimic either of those men, right. it would probably not work. Right. Well, yeah, it might work. might not be the call in your life. But what we're saying is the call in your life is to pray. Right. Figure it out. <laughs> you got to do it. And these guys just decided the way we're going to do it, the way we figured out with our schedule, is we're the busiest guys that we know. And if you're John Wesley, there's nobody in England probably busier than you are. And yet, the most important thing that I can do is pray, and the only way I can pray is to say no to other people that need me, need me in that moment. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's what John Wesley Stanley Jones would tell you. Yet, from what you said earlier, they were very strict, but not so rigid to the point that if someone interrupted, he would accept it from God. But that's what Stanley listening. Jones did specifically with his. Uh, because he, he, he talks about one of the books. Because if would, they were just like rigid on this, like a machine, then they wouldn't do that. All right. Can I, can I offer some an sensitive. example? I, I knew about a particular evangelist that had a, a time of prayer. When he would go to a particular meeting, he would, you know, he would determine a place and he would pray at a particular time each day. On one occurrence, uh, he was away and he'd come back. They'd locked him out. He can't get in. So he's so broken about the fact that he can't get in here to pray at this particular time. I think that's, I mean, Yes, there's something positive there, and probably some people in this room know who I'm talking about, but yet, why don't you just pray? Why don't pray. you just stop right there and pray? There why you don't go. you do, you realize, man, I'm, I got caught up in that appointment, I'm 30 minutes late, we'll pray. Yeah. I mean, that, that's all I'm talking about, flexibility. John Hyde of India made prayer such a dominant characteristic of his life, he was actually nicknamed after prayer. That'd be kind of cool. So, the two foundational spiritual exercises for the cultivation of the inner life they're not the only exercises, but they are foundational, and that is prayer and Bible study. Uh, if you graph your spiritual history, it will likely show that you're going to get peaks where you're doing well at prayer and Bible study. You get the valleys where you're probably not doing so well. So, we need to develop our souls while we pray, and develop our souls as we read and are formed by Scripture. So, a couple things here on prayer. Stanley Jones notes that where there's no effective prayer life, the heart of religion has ceased to beat and religion becomes a dead body of forms and customs and dogmas. And yet how very few Christians have an effective prayer life. And boy, that, that's incredibly true. Almost no one's doing it. If I were to put my finger on the greatest lack in American Christianity, I would unhesitatingly point to the need for an effective prayer life among lady and ministers. <laughs> 